Donald Hebb had already taught himself to read by the age of three. He breezed through school, and in the way of many brilliant people, was an indifferent student as an undergrad at Dalhousie. In our third year, my father persuaded Donald to uh, move into honors, physics, and math. Without any effort, he was right at the top of the, of the class in math, but he wasn't interested, and uh, in his fourth year, he moved back into a general arts course. After graduating in 1925 with a BA in English and philosophy, he took a job as an elementary school teacher, in part so he could pursue his goal of writing the great Canadian novel. He put an entry into the, uh, for the DeMille Prize essay. He made an entry for that as an annual prize. Uh, and it was a, uh, it was fiction, it was a story. And, uh, and all I can remember was the first line of it. <laughs> and it, because it had been repeated by other people. But, but it was, over the stern rail she leaned a slender figure in the darkness. On discovery that he wasn't cut out to be a novelist, he returned to university to study psychology. It was during his postdoctoral fellowship with Wilder Penfield at the Montreal Neurological Institute that the ideas for his breakthrough began to form. They crystallized during his five-year appointment at the Yerkes Primate Center in Florida. He's writing the manuscript, so he worked seven days a week usually. We didn't see much of him. I remember feeling quite cheesed because he wasn't at my uh, school, you know, meet the parents day thing. Why were all the other kids' parents there and mine wasn't? The manuscript was completed at McGill and published in 1949 as the Organization of Behavior. By placing the formation of ideas physically in the brain, Dr. Hebb removed psychology from the realm of metaphysics and placed it firmly in the world of science. The effect of the organization of behavior was so immediate and so remarkable that it's been compared to Darwin's origin of the species. What Head did really was to take the old association of ideas, theories, and instead of having them in some sort of mental black box or in, uh, in a, a mental world which was quite divorced from the physical world, he put it into the brain, which allowed people to think of good experiments that they could do to see what the relationship between the brain and behavior was. And uh, it's now just a, a, a tremendous enterprise. In high school, one of my teachers in the very first year had been one of his students or had been at McGill and said, Heb, you're not related to and I sat there in absolute horror that I was being singled out and I was obviously a freak. And she, she and another one went on raving on about what a genius he was and I thought I was going to die. I really did, I, I thought I would die, but it was the first inkling I had. Donald Hebb went on to become head of psychology at McGill and eventually chancellor. He continued research aimed at expanding knowledge about the physiological basis of behavior, but devoted more and more energy to teaching. Even as his academic honors accumulated, he continued to deliver the introductory course in psychology to overflowing lecture halls of rapt students. And his graduate seminars were the stuff of legend. His seminars were, were really something. Everybody had to take his seminars. I think everybody enjoyed them. He sat there with his stopwatch, and his pencil, and his bits of paper. He was a teacher to the end. Researcher, educator, administrator, sailor, D.O. Hebb excelled at all of these and more. But he was gifted with something else, that spark that comes so very rarely, but when it does, changes the world. I know he was shocked, he was astounded, and, and I'm sure that it gave him satisfaction. I'm just not sure how much he realized how big it became. I don't know that those things are always immediately evident. You see people responding, but it, you, you don't necessarily see all the waves that you're making when you throw a 
pebble in the water.